one. Okay, we are now recording. I'll go ahead and stop my video and I will let people in three, two, one. Welcome, welcome to everyone joining us virtually. I'm starting to see people trickle in. We'll get started momentarily. Do you see that question, Dr. McTeer? Is the recording going to be posted anywhere after the events? No. So these uh, lectures actually will only be sent out to the students who are on the inside. Um, that was our intent of this uh, lecture series. Um, but we wanted to um, make it available to the public, um, virtual, live, I guess you could say. It's, so. I think I can, we can read, but we'll have them, but we can revisit that uh, with each individual lecture to see if they're okay with that. So I could talk to you offline, uh, Dr. Willingham about it. Okay. I'm going to shut my window, one second. <laughs> We'll give it a couple more minutes and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right. It's 201. All right, so we'll get started in about a minute. Um, so that way we can maximize the time that we have with Dr. Bria Willingham. All right, got a couple more people still popping in. All right, Dr. Willingham, you ready? Let's do it. All right. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to our first uh, Maggie Garb lecture series. I am Dr. Terrence McTeer, the director of the Prison Education Project here at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm so excited to be kicking off this uh, event and having some 
of my friends and some of the scholars who are transforming the field of higher education in prison uh, with me. Um, today, we have Dr. Bria Willingham, who is an interdisciplinary scholar and criminal justice uh, professor whose teaching and research examines the intersection of race, gender, higher education, and the criminal injustice system. She is particularly interested in examining Black women's experiences with higher education in prison and amplifying the voices of Black women impacted by the injustice system. Influenced by her experience as a sister and aunt of two men serving life sentences, Dr. Willingham's research also focuses on the societal ramifications of mass incarceration, especially its impact on families. She has presented her research in academic conferences nationally and internationally, and given lectures at universities in the United States and the United Kingdom. Dr. Willingham is a co-founder of the Jamil, uh, Jamie Sister LLC, an organization that offers a safe and innovative space for Black women in higher education in prison. She's also managing editor of the New Journal of Higher Education in Prison, a peer reviewed journal that published solely on the topics and issues in higher education in prison. Dr. Willingham is writing a book about higher education in women's prisons. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn over the floor to her and she can rock and roll herself. <laughs> <laughs> well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good day, wherever you are. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. McTeer. I am very excited to speak to all of you about um, Black women in higher education in prison. And I titled my talk, Sisters of Carceral Liberation, um, building a movement for and about Black women in higher education in prison. Um, and so I want to really, I'm just gonna have a conversation with you today. I'm not, it's not gonna be a formal lecture with bullet points and all of that. I like to keep it real. And so that's what this is gonna be about. So I wanna start by telling you a story that, um, that happened to me some years ago when I was a volunteer for the Correctional Association of New York. And we were doing a, a prison visit at one of the prisons here in New York State. And I remember as I was talking to some of the men in the facility that I was asking for their name and I was asking one of the men to spell his name for me. And as you know, it's, it's uh, always noisy in, in a prison and so I couldn't hear him. And so I knelt down and I asked him just to place his ID on top of my clipboard so that I could um, uh, write his name down correctly. And I remember one of the, um, one of the, the docs um, employees, some white, old white man who was monitoring our visit and he came over to me and he put his finger in my face and he started to, um, to yell at me and, and to tell me that I was breaking the rules by touching the inmate, by touching his, um, his ID. And he's talking to me, he's doing like this. Now, as I said, I was um, kneeling down. So I stood up. And I told him under no circumstances, now finger to finger, under no circumstances was he to ever talk to me like that again. And then there were some other things said, and I'll just leave that to the imagination. Um, but one of my colleagues had to intervene and you know, push the man away from me because I was not backing down. And it was in that moment that I realized that although I am a woman and I was in a, um, a, a prison for men, that this uh, Department of Corrections employee did not see me any differently than he saw the Black men or any other men who were incarcerated in that facility. And I would say, looking back on that, that was a foreshadowing of sorts of the work that my sister colleagues and I are doing with the Jami Sisterhood. 
I'm gonna talk a little bit about what JAMI is, what we do, and what it means to be black women building this movement of, uh, for social justice and, um, and creating our space within the higher education in prison field. So last year, along myself, along with my sister colleagues, doctors Erin Corbett and Bahia Muhammad, we decided that essentially we were sick and tired of being sick and tired of Black women not having a space in the higher education and prison field. We decided that we were no longer going to ask for permission for a seat at the white people's table. And we decided that we were going to build our own table. We are going to build our own chairs, create our own space and do our own thing. And so that's what we did. And that's what we have been doing. We chose the word Jami because it is Swahili for the word community. And that is what we are doing. We are building a community, a sisterhood for other black women who are doing this, doing this work, but have not yet found their community. So um, the, the goal then of, of Jami is to provide this safe and innocent innovative space for black women in higher education and prison in the field, whether they are researchers, whether they are just as impacted, whether they are educators, whatever the work that they are doing within this in, within this field, JAMI is there to assist them. And we are also providing professional development and equity, real racial equity, cultural competency and race relations um, to education professionals, we are doing the work, we are not performing the work. There is a difference. Um, Jami, then, we are filling this much needed hole in the overwhelmingly white higher education and prison field that often overlooks the, uh, the voices of Black women. Um, and so myself and Drs. Muhammad and Corbett, then we are bringing decades of higher education experience to JAMI, because as I said, we do the work, we do not perform the work. So what does that mean? That means that um, last year when we all had to uh, you know, succumb to quarantine, um, everyone's at the house, right? So we decided that we will do what we do best and that is educate the masses. So we created a, um, a series of webinars beginning with our first one and we aptly titled it Black Women in Higher Education in Prison. That was held in May of 20, May 28th of 2020. And I will say that, um, before going into this work, we knew that this space was needed, but we did not know just how much it was needed. And so when we had our first webinar, we, you know, we jokingly said to ourselves, um, if we get 20 people, we would be, we would be great. You know, we can make our, our mistakes and then we can learn from that. By the, uh, by the end of the first week that we, uh, after we opened registration, we had over 100 registrants by the time we held our webinar. We had 300, um, over 300 people who had registered and um, approximately 180 people who had um, logged on to, um, to hear what we had to say. So <clears throat> this space then, we, this space was, has been created and curated because as black women, we have to carve out the space that we deserve for the work that we bring our labor to. The voice of black women is privileged. It is amplified and it will always unapologetically be the focus of any conversation that Jami um, facilitates because we are unapologetically for and about black women in higher education and prison. And I'll also add that Anytime Black women are, um, are creating spaces and are, are leading movements of any kind in any field, then if it's truly going to be for and about Black women, then it needs to unapologetically be for and about women. Because again, it's about doing the work, not performing the work.
And so our, uh, you know, uh, our, our objective for that first webinar and for our subsequent webinars then was to, to talk about the, the specific and the unique challenges that we as Black women face as we navigate the academy, as we navigate our communities, as we navigate these prisons. And it is really important that we identify all of the ways in which these things focus um, um, and how they intertwine and how they, inter how they intersect. Um, I'm going to quote my, my colleague, Dr. Corbett here, when she says that the, the history and the work of Black women is always being erased. And at the same time, people are standing on our shoulders and they are benefiting from the work that we do. And so again, Jami exists to let y'all know. And when I say y'all, I, I mean, um, um, students on the inside, I mean administrators of programs, I mean um, employees of departments of corrections nationwide, you are standing on our shoulders and we are here doing the work and we will continue to be here doing the work because it is important that Black women show up and show out when doing this work. Um, some of the challenges of doing the work because oh let me back up for a second um i was i will also add that an, another um important reason for black women doing this work is because without us <laughs> leading the effort um without us um adding our perspectives then the education that your students are receiving on the inside is going to be lopsided. It, it is whenever you leave out Black women's perspectives in any aspect of this work, whether it's specifically in higher education and prison, or whether it's in the criminal legal system or injustice system as a whole, you are not getting the whole story. You are robbing your students of a lot of rich history, of a lot of the nuances that go into this work that quite frankly, your um, white professors are, or educators are not going to be able to do. No matter how hard they try to be us, they will not be able to do us. So I will say though that this work um, for Black women is not easy. Um, Black women have to be uh, extra vigilant about how they navigate this system, not, not they, about how we navigate this system. We have to be skillful about how we navigate the system in order to do the work that we were put here to do. So being a Black woman in this space means that our existence in this field of higher education in prison, um, in these classrooms, means that we are defying an entire system. And what do I mean by that? This system, well, let me just say, we are working in, um, in, in, in this interesting paradox with these two systems, right? So when we are working inside this prison system, we are working within a system that was built to imprison us, okay? And when we are working in these education systems, um, whether it's higher education or otherwise, then we are working in this system that really was not designed for us, right? So we are navigating two different systems, having to wear several different hats to navigate each one of these successfully. And so when we show up as whole doctors, as I am and as my colleagues are, when we show up as whole doctors within both of these systems, but, act, but uh, especially within these prison systems to deliver, these to deliver education, um, we are defying the space simply by showing up, simply by stepping foot inside these classrooms. So um, also in, in defying this, defying that space simply by being, um, by being present physically, by being present theoretically, 
all of that also means that as Black women in this space, and when we are doing this work, we have to first acknowledge and then reconcile our own traumas within this criminal injustice system. So whether that means we have relatives or loved ones who are incarcerated or, or who have been incarcerated, myself included, or if we ourselves have been just as involved, we need to acknowledge what that means to the work. Uh, we need to acknowledge the baggage um, that we carry with us when we are doing this work. And then we need to come to terms with that. So what do I mean by that? What, how do we do this? First, um, again, as I said, it's important to acknowledge our personal connection to the system and, and how we navigate that and how we carry that baggage. Um, Black women who work in higher education and prison, um, we not only come with our personal baggage, um, and by personal baggage, I mean, um, you know, for those of us who have incarcerated relatives or who have been affected by this system, but we also come with the, the baggage of our, of our families. Um, we come with, um, you know, sometimes carrying the baggage uh, or either feeling like we need to carry this baggage of the entire Black community because as Black women, that's what we are conditioned to do. Um, and so putting all of that into context, then our Black womanhood informs the work that we do. It, not just in higher education, but in whatever aspect of the system that we are working in. And so when you see Black women who are either in the Jami sisterhood or just Black women who are, you know, in this space in, in, in other aspects, you need to understand that um, our road to get there has not been easy. And I'll talk more about that at the end. Um, and also, you know, we are navigating this system that sees us as no different than the students whom we are there to educate. Y'all doing okay? Because I got some more for you. So, <sighs> another thing. Um, another thing that, that we as Black women in this space do is, is we as Black women who are um, leading um, any, any social justice movement, but especially social justice in the context of higher education and prison. It is important for us to um, sometimes have to educate the, the, the white people who are doing this work and the white people who think they are, that they are the only ones who can do this work um, and who think they can do it better than us. Now, granted, it is not a competition, but there are, there are some people who believe that it is and have placed themselves into competition with us. Foolishly, I may add. So um, I have some advice then for, um, for any white person who is interested in doing this work or who is doing the work and you are in a facility or facilities that um, where, you're, where they, the majority of your students are black. And I, I, I like to talk about it in terms of um, fetishizing, fetishizing, ugh, tongue twister there, incarcerated black students as black bodies that are nothing more than objects for white instructors to manipulate their ill-conceived versions of blackness. It is especially important for higher education in prison instructors to see their students as people, not as bodies to exploit through a white gaze, if true education is to happen. Now, when I say this too, um, let me, uh, it's important that I also specify that this doesn't always um, only happen for white instructors. There are some black instructors who get caught up in this, in this white gaze, in this trap of the white gaze, there are some black instructors who may, um, you know, uh, well, I'm just gonna be blunt and say it, forget they too are black and may fall victim to um, the same white supremacist ways of 
teaching that white some white instructors do as well. So while it is likely that um, black incarcerated students come to prison by some um, some kind of trauma, it is imperative to understand they are not their trauma. Resist and reject the stereotypical criminal legal systems narratives of black individuals. I'll quote George Yancey's book, Black Bodies and, and White Gaze, when he says, white gazes have attempted to define black bodies as problem bodies, as dangerous and unwanted bodies, as desired and hypersexualized bodies, as strange bodies, as curious bodies, as freakish bodies. If you are then going into these carceral spaces to deliver higher education, and you are looking at your black students as just bodies, you have already failed. If you are looking to go into these carceral spaces to deliver these to deliver education to incarcerated individuals, and you you have some reservations and you are already nervous about going into um, a carceral um, space, you have already failed. And um, I'll just also quote quickly Bell Hooks in her essay, The Oppositional Gaze, when she asks, asks educators what they see when they look at their black students. So what, do you, what are you looking at when you see your black students? What do you see when you look at your black students and when you interact with your black students? Do you see yourself? Probably not if you're white. And so it is of the utmost importance then to abandon the white savior complex by recognizing your privilege as white men or um, white women or white people in general. Educate yourself about what's going on in the world today, particularly with all of the uprisings that happened last year and the social injustices that continue to be perpetrated against Black bodies on the daily. Educate yourself about the underlying issues of why Black men and Black women participate in these protests and these uprisings. When you start to get a better understanding of the under underlying issues of why, you may begin to get an idea about what it truly means to be Black and in prison, and then and only then will you truly understand what it means to educate incarcerated Black people. Um, I'll also say that um, as it particularly relates to, um, to women um, who, are under, who are educated and who are incarcerated, um, and especially um, Black women and, and women of color who are educated and are in, incarcerated, that their education in their um, incarceration should not be seen as a deficit. Their education should not be a mark that is checked against them. They can be used to help to edu educate other women who are incarcerated. There, so in other words, there's no such thing as too much education. And so with um, with Jami Sisterhood, we are also interested in working with those women who are just as impacted and, and who are educated. So the work that we do is not just to deliver education to, um, to people who have not been form formally educated thus far, um, but we are working with all populations who, um, uh, who want to be educated because as we all know, education doesn't stop when you get a degree. <clears throat> um, check my time. Okay, I got about five minutes left. So I'm going to try and <laughs> say, that, say everything else in, in five minutes here. Um, with Jami Sisterhood, um, again, It's clear that we've made an impact um, just by the the webinars that we've have that we have done, um, and we have had to, um, you know, fight against the the racist theft of our work since we started since our organ organization was created, um, and even we we have been called angry. <laughs> 
and we have been we have we have been called racist um and we have had to call people out on stealing our work we we do it publicly we do it shamelessly we do it unapologetically because what we have proven is everything that we have said, everything that I have said here today, we have we have proven it in our work. And when uh, when white people continue to try and still our work, they prove number one why Jami is necessary. Not that we need white people to, to prove that that we need to exist, but they they continue to um, to prove time and time and again how uh, much. Black women in this space are needed because we are doing the work. We are not performing the work. And so they recognize that. And so then they want to try and come and steal our work. And so we have had webinars that deal with that as well. Um, we have a, a symposium that is coming up in March and it is called I was sold to the highest bidder. And it's a, it's a symposium that's for women of color in the criminal legal system. And when we posted that on, posted the save the date flyer on our Facebook page, we got responses <laughs> from white men who were big mad, <laughs> deep in their feelings bag, because how dare you have a symposium that is just for women of color. We have been called racist and other names in the book that are really irrelevant, but we don't care. We don't care. What we care about is again, doing the work. What we care about is um, um, having this space and continuing to create more spaces for black women and all women of color who are doing this work. Um, it, Jami exists because, uh, you know, we, we are validating the existence of Black women. Um, because as Black women, again, we understand, and I'm quoting myself here from a, a TEDx talk that I did in December, we understand the adept skill it takes to tiptoe on the fragile tightrope that is code switching simultaneously existing and non-existing in white spaces that are not designed for us and in a society that is hell-bent on continuing to denigrate us. This simultaneous existing and non-existing helps to create a hyper invisibility of black women that is fueled by decentering our experiences. Too often black women are only seen when white people are stealing our intellectual prowess or pretending to be us. And so when we do this work in this space, again, whether it is in um, higher education in prison specifically, whether it is in um, the academy, whether it is in you know the, the criminal legal system field, whatever aspect of the work that Black women um, do, um, it often comes at a personal price. And I'm going to end my remarks um, with this thought. For many of us, myself included, we have incarcerated relatives and the personal connection to the work is what drives us to do the work. That cost can be, um, that cost can be a high one though, because we are balancing the hyphen between researcher, researcher, scholar, and activist, educator, and activist, and so on. So that makes us emotionally spent in the lines and the hyphen sometimes become so blurred we sometimes lose ourselves in this work, but that's why Jami exists. Well, one of the reasons why, to help black women in this space navigate the emotional and the traumatic terrain of higher education and prison so that when we show up, we do so whole, not broken. So to the students who are listening to this, um, when you see a black woman enter your classroom, do not take her presence for granted. Chances are she's had to fight many of battles from within the system, without it, um, within the system and outside of the system, just to get there, just to show up, just to be in that room. So please respect black women in this space 
as my shirt says, trust black women who are doing this work, our sacrifices and our hustle um, in this higher education in prison field and in social justice, because in, uh, to, to cite my colleague, sister, sister scholars, doctors Bahia Muhammad and Brittany Gatewood, black women do resistance, not activism. Thank y'all. Thank you so much, Dr. Willingham, for that riveting uh, lecture. I'm so excited for, <laughs> to review this. It's um, very powerful and very thought provoking. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank the Maggie Garp family for making this lecture series possible. Um, just as an aside, if you don't know who uh, Dr. Maggie Garb is, she is the founding director of the Prison Education Project here at WashU. And without her family and their, their giving, um, this lecture series wouldn't be possible. So I definitely want to shout them out and say thank you for the continuous work they have done uh, thus far. Um, for those who are on, I just want to kind of give a quick announcement. Uh, tomorrow uh, at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, we'll be having Dr. Chris Beasley kick off another lecture series with us. It'll be 30 minutes. And then on Wednesday from 12 to one, we'll have our main speaker, uh, Sarita Steve. Um, I'm so excited to be having each and every one of them come to speak. Um, thank you, Dr. Willingham, for taking the time out to engage with us. Oh, and I hope, good. Yeah, yeah. And I hope everyone has uh, taken something from this lecture series um, as we all continue to do the work um, in this space. Until next time and until tomorrow, Peace, love, and soul. Peace. <laughs> Thank you all. Okay, with that, I'm ending the webinar in three, two, one.